Uh, we're about to uh, pursue um, the oral private practical test standards for the private pilot lighter than air free balloon. Uh, this is for the May 1997 edition of the practical test standards, PTS. So if there's been a newer version sent out or published, um, when you see this, there may be some different questions and answers. So anyway, we'll go right down the list. Uh, the practical test standards is the minimum guide for uh, testing for the respective licenses or certificates in the FAA. And they're made up of two different, basically two different types of questions. One is the oral part of the test, and the other is the flight part of the test. We're going to focus on the oral part of the test. So starting at area of operations, number one, pre-flight preparation. Task A, certificates and documents. Number one, the question asked if the student can determine that the applicant Number one, exhibits knowledge of the elements related to certificates and documents by explaining the appropriate A, pilot certificate privileges and limitations, B, medical statement, and C, pilot logbook or flight record and the required entries. So we'll start with A. The private pilot certificate privileges, the basic main privilege is that you can take passengers. A limitation is that you can't charge them. You are able to share expenses. This does not mean you can share amortization of the balloon, but only gas and oil if oil is used. So that's spelled out and it's very clear. To get a balloon certificate, you do not need a medical statement, nor do you need a medical, obviously. There used to be a rule that you had to sign that you were of sound body and mind to fly a hot air balloon, but that's no longer required. The pilot logbook or flight record, what is required? Do you have to log every entry, every flight that you make? The, the minimum requirements are that you log flights that are towards a certificate, in other words, training flights, you have to log flights that are required once you have certificates, such as the flights that, that maintain currency, for instance. In other words, once you have a pilot certificate, you have to have three takeoffs and landings within every 90 days. So if those aren't logged, obviously you're not current. But those have to be logged as well as a flight review, which is required every two years, 24 months. And that's basically all you have to log. It's a great idea to log everything, though, to, um, to demonstrate that you pay close attention to what you're doing um, and, to, and for purposes, sometimes you'll need to go back and um, maybe even for legal purposes to demonstrate that you've flown a certain amount of hours or, or some such and sometimes the insurance companies want to know this as well so the next section is uh, task a number two the applicant exhibits knowledge of the elements related to certificates and documents by locating and explaining the airworthiness and registration certificates well the airworthiness and registration certificates should be located in the balloon the airworthiness being um, in clear view of everyone. If you get on a 747 and you look at the wall as you're going in, you'll likely see their airworthiness certificate. The airworthiness certificate says, if you read it, it says that the balloon or aircraft has been maintained according to the factory requirements. In other words, it's had its annuals and any maintenance, repairs done. And it's done according to the FAA, any repairs. And also, it says that it has not been modified from its original design. When a manufacturer gets a type certificate, 
they essentially have a blueprint of a design. They test it for the FAA, and once the FAA approves it, then if they, the FAA allows them to build subsequent balloons if they stay to that exact blueprint, and, and it, they will all have this type certificate issued along with the balloon. The benefit of a type certificate is it, it gives you the most latitude of anything uh, of any kind for an aircraft. In other words, you can fly for hire, you, you can take passengers, you can, you can do anything you want, you can fly over congested areas. Any other um, built, home built or experimental has certain limitations that don't allow you to essentially fly for hire. Uh, registration is just uh, simply like a car registration, but it's with the FAA. It, um, it tells the, the government who you are, who the owner is. Uh, sometimes there's notifications. They want to know who you are. And uh, those two things have to be in the balloon. Now, operating limitations, placards, instrument markings, handbooks, and manuals. The... Um, the balloon has three instruments that are required to be on board. There is no uh, provision to be able to put a placard up and say something isn't working and then, you know, fly anyway. Some airplanes have numerous instruments and only some of them are on their minimum required list. And those, if, if they're not required by the flight manual, you can placard them and say they're not working. If something is not working, you do want to placard it because you don't want to be misled with any information you get from there. But you're not allowed to fly if something, one of the balloon instruments is not working. Um, and of course, uh, Flight manual is required to be on board, and this has the weight and data information for that particular balloon. It has the care and feeding, as such, of your balloon, and your flight limitations, and things of that nature. In general, it's a good book to review and know because it gives you all the detail for your balloon. The weight data, including the equipment list as appropriate, um, that's in the flight manual that's issued when you buy your balloon. Airworthiness directives and compliance records, maintenance, inspection requirements, and appropriate records. Airworthiness directives are sometimes called ADs. They are issued by the manufacturer initially because there's some kind of problem that, that um, some degradation, something, uh, uh, something is going wrong, and it's usually something fairly serious, they notify the FAA, and the FAA actually issues the AD. Uh, many times they will give you to, to the next annual to get it fixed. Sometimes uh, the AD requires that you fix whatever the problem is right away before you take off again. De depends on the seriousness and the... Um, uh, you know, the odds of problems or failures at the next flight. But those are mandatory requirements. They have to be fixed. Generally, you will get a notice from the manufacturer if you're an owner of record. In other words, if you have it registered. However, the repair stations are required to keep this information, and uh, they, they, tend to be, uh, they tend to watch carefully when a balloon comes in for annual, for instance, to see if there's an AD out. Balloon ADs aren't very common. There's only, I don't know, 15 or 20 over all the balloons ever made, somewhere in there. But uh, they are still very important. Generally, the new balloons don't have those same ADs. Those situations have been rectified. Um, inspection records. Um, a balloon, just like every aircraft, is required to have a, an annual inspection. If you fly for hire, fly commercially, you're also required to have a 100-hour inspection, whichever comes first. In other words, if you're flying your commercial balloon 200 hours a year, you're going to have to have two inspections. 
the inspections in a balloon are very similar so uh, it's quite common for a pair station to call it an annual slash 100 hour so that uh, it covers your annual and if you don't do any more flying the rest of the year you can wait a whole year to get to get another inspection um, all of these records have to be put in the balloon logbook. There's an aircraft logbook and a personal logbook. And the aircraft logbook um, has all the inspection records from, from the day it was built, the initial inspection, until all the repairs. It shows all the annuals and any repairs that are done, and all of that has to be in there. It also has uh, room for uh, any preventive maintenance that's done. And preventive maintenance can be done by the pilot. This is usually things cleaning up. Uh, there are some limited wicker applications you can do as a pilot. But generally, if, if it requires disassembly uh, or anything of that nature, uh, it, it's, it has to be done by a repair station. But when you do any cleaning, cleaning the burner, for instance, uh, clean the soot off or doing some minor wicker work or whatever, you, uh, you need to put your name, certificate number, what you did, and the date in there. And you might wonder why that's important. It's probably not that important. It's just that uh, if you were ever in some legal battle, um, for instance, it would be nice to show that you paid attention and did, you know, did things by the book and that you maintained your balloon. Shows, you know, an effort in your part rather than any kind of negligence. So uh, it's a good idea to do that. Now we're going on to task B, weather information. Requirements here. Request that the student exhibit knowledge of the elements related to weather information by analyzing weather reports and forecasts from various sources with emphasis on surface wind. What is surface wind and what's the significance of surface wind? Well, that's pretty simple. Surface wind is the wind along the ground level, and I guess if you had to define it, maybe up to treetop level or just above that. What's the significance of it? Well, a number of things. If it's too windy, it's, it's risky for balloons to fly, difficult to get off the ground, but probably more importantly, it, makes, it, it ensures that you're going to have a windy landing unless you're flying in the evening in some places. The direction is also significant because if nothing ever changes up above, you know that you're going to likely end up downwind of where you take off. So the surface wind becomes a strategy point, if you will, for selecting where you take off. If you don't include uh, or even integrate the, the knowledge of the upper winds and only use the surface wind, you, you will survive. In other words, you can just take the surface wind and go straight up wind from where you want to land and you should be able to take that surface wind all the way there. So it becomes a criteria for selecting your takeoff spot. And winds aloft. Well, winds aloft are the winds above the ground. And the FAA um, issues forecasts for, for all aviators and we are particularly interested in that because it it creates, uh, well, it does a number of things for us. Um, the winds aloft tend to be um, forecast in 3,000 foot increments throughout the country. If you live at near zero, you're going to ask for the winds at 3,000 feet, 6,000 feet, 9,000, and sometimes 12. Why? Well, if you get in a jam, it's nice to know those uh, different directions are up there for uh, navigation purposes. But also, if they're very fast, even though it looks good on the surface, if those upper winds are very fast, it gives you a little bit of a red flag as to whether you should fly or not, because those winds will quite often come down to the surface. The most critical wind is the first wind aloft. 
which at, wherever you live, that might be the 3,000 foot wind, uh, 6,000, some places it's the 9,000. But that first wind aloft, which is the one up there, 1,000 to 3,000 feet above your head, quite often is, is sitting up there only because overnight they're usually a boundary layer or an inversion on the ground that keeps that, that stuff from coming to the ground. And so as a balloonist, if all you're looking at is what you see, you may think it's a good day to go fly when it may not be. We may, you may have a surprise coming. Because as the sun heats the ground and breaks up the inversion and the boundary layer, which has protected the surface from that faster wind, uh, as it breaks down, that stuff comes right down. And if it's going fast, the, uh, well, that's what you're going to land in. And Windy landings in balloons uh, sometimes really aren't that aren't, aren't that problematic, uh, but they the risk can go way up with uh, different situations. If you're in congested area, uh, thermal area, you're, or you're shoved into the mountains, there's there's a lot of criteria. If it's nice open country with lots of room to land, flat ground, a little less alarming. Um, it's good to have a reasonable amount of experience before you get stuck in a real windy landing. It's good to have uh, have gone through enough landings to where you, you kind of understand what's going to happen. But uh, anyway, those are the winds aloft and, and how they play a part. And they're also uh, important for steerage. Uh, certainly you're going to jump up and catch that first one now and then or know that it's there. And whatever you have on the surface, you, you integrate what component is the first one up, and you, you can use that for your flight planning or where you plan to go and how to get out of a jam if you're going the wrong way. Wind shear. Wind shear is the intersection, the horizontal intersection of two wind directions. In other words, if one wind, the surface wind's going uh, 320, and usually wind shear tends to um, define significant changes in a small area. Uh, anytime you get a turn in a balloon, there's a wind shear because one wind's going this way and there's an upper wind going that way. But wind shear tends to define something that's pretty radical. And, and usually the change happens within maybe a balloon height or higher, or depending if it's real high winds, it can be, you know, a bigger spread, but this, it, the balloon's distorting and twisting and bending. Um, in the mountains, we, we have a lot of shears because down below uh, the mountain peaks, it's protected. And just above, you've got a airflow going across. Well, wherever those hit is a wind shear. Now, what does it do to the balloon? It... The top part pushes pushes the balloon, the part that it catches, because you're usually ascending or you know you don't know it's there, and you go up and pushes the top of the balloon. Well, the lower balloon is in what would be you know what it was in, let's say dead air, and this wind hits it. Well, it caves the underside of the balloon in as it's pushing the top of the balloon over, and it's windy and it distorts, and sometimes when it's real severe, closes the mouth up on you. What do you do? Well, uh, when you're up high, generally there's no reason to panic. Normally you have a little bit of inertia going up. So if you feel that, and what, what you feel as a pilot is big breeze. All of a sudden, this thing is pushing the top of the balloon, dragging the basket when, when just moments before it was fairly stable. You're in a shear. You're about to get into another wind. In other words, if you were immediately up, 200 feet, you'd be in another wind. So what you want to do is keep that inertia going, pop, 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 you know, as long as it hadn't been real severe and caved it in, keep, keep the heat in and punch yourself through there. So you want to go through shears in general, you want to go through them quickly. You don't want to linger because it, it, all it'll do is cool the balloon, it'll be windy and, and you can't burn very well and you'll fall out of it. So you want to punch through wind shears as quickly as possible. Pyreps, those are pilot reports. And those are called in in real time to the flight service. 
the FAA's flight service normally uh, gives pilot briefings, and we always call in the morning before we go, we get the winds aloft and uh, any weather patterns that are coming through and, and so on and so forth. Well, during the morning, uh, as people are out there flying, based on those forecasts, sometimes they find out they're, they're not accurate. Uh, there can be some major turbulence where they were told before it's calm, or uh, there can be some bad shears, or the surface winds can be really going when they, when they were told it's going to be calm. And the way that uh, this feedback comes through is through a pie rep. Uh, if you have an aircraft radio, which we have sometimes, sometimes we don't, you can normally call flight service from the radio and say, uh, hey, over here we have windy conditions and it's very turbulent and uh, your forecast was for calm air. And what they do is they take that information and put it on the computer and immediately relay that to people who call in and say, we've had a pie rep that this situation is occurring over here. So be, be advised. A pie rep from today is fairly worthless for tomorrow. It's all real-time stuff. SIGMET and AIRMET. SIGMET is a significant meteorological condition. And uh, it's usually associated with thunderstorms. They're actually called convective SIGMETs, but they're dangerous weather. Tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, there are warnings to all aircraft, big, small, every, anybody that's out there. It's nasty weather. And I don't think there's an exception, but a balloon would never want to be flying if there's a SIGMET in the area. Air METs. Air METs are um, warnings, weather warnings for light aircraft. Now, sometimes they're very significant for balloons and many times not so significant. Uh, they tend to be um, maybe a, a heavy crosswind on an airport, which for us would not be a good, a good sign. But a lot of times it's mountain obscurement when you're, um, you're flying through the mountains and traversing and going somewhere in an airplane. You want to know that uh, perhaps you know, this clear air on this side is going to degrade into something bad on the other. Whereas for us, we're flying in one location, and that may not be um, appropriate. It, it, it may not be significant for us. So SIGMET is significant meteorological condition, and AIRMET is a warning for light aircraft. Is there any questions? Everybody understanding this? Good, good, glad to hear. One additional comment about weather and how it relates to ballooning. The most critical part of weather is, is understanding what a forecast in your area means to your flying conditions there. And this information or understanding only comes after time. In other words, in my area, for instance, if, if I have more than 11 to 12 knots forecast at the first elevation, at the first winds aloft, it's going to be breezy for the most part that morning. doesn't matter what else is going on. That may not be true for anybody else's area. Maybe I've been in the Midwest where it's been 20, 30 knots up at 3,000 feet, and we've flown a reasonable flight down below. It's just different. And the way it's, it's, it's not rocket science, but there are certain red flags that will come up that you'll begin to recognize, especially if you get bit flying when you probably shouldn't have. You'll realize that when a forecast that includes this, this, or this, it's going to be risky, and it's very diff There are some common things. There are some common uh, things to look out for, and the obvious things. But in your particular area, that comes from experience. And if you're nervous to go fly a certain day, certainly don't go. 
What you need to do, though, is keep an eye out for the conditions, maybe let some pie balls off that morning, and verify, was it a good day or a bad day? Did it shape up, or did everything break down? And that way you, you develop your own database, and you know what you can do and what you can't. And that's the, the critical thing. There's, there's no way to teach. You can teach the things that are obviously bad, but the decision to go or not to go is uh, sometimes... Um, a local thing. The, the, the ultimate decision to go or not to go is based on, comes from two different directions. And one is the forecast. And if there's any red flags, and certainly if the surface wind where you're going to fly is 10 knots gusting to 15, pretty much a no-brainer. Or if it's raining or going, forecast to rain and there's clouds out there, um, you know, uh, pretty much an easy decision. It's those decisions that um, they say is it's uh, fit five knots now, but it's expected to pick up to 15 in the next hour. And perhaps you go, well, I've seen this before and it didn't come up. And then you go out to the field and you look and it looks good. Well, it's a dilemma. You know, it's a tough call. But what you try to integrate is the forecast and any red flags and what you go see at the field. Sometimes they jive. Sometimes a forecast says don't fly and the field looks perfect. Sometimes the field is blowing or marginal, but the forecast is great. Those are the tough ones. But you use both of those, I guess, somewhat in equal amounts. The forecast, you make an evaluation based on that. And then many times you'll just go to the field and you'll say, the field looks this way, the clouds look this way, I don't see any cumulus clouds, looks stable, yet the forecast is terrible. You know, those, and you've got to um, reconcile that. So you look at two different things. You look at the forecast and the actual. Okay, task B, under weather information, number two. The applicant exhibits knowledge of the elements related to weather information by explaining various atmospheric conditions and their effect on balloon flight, including temperature and pressure variations. Apparently, pressure variations are important when you're flying an airplane. They, they create... You can go into low pressure and can create significantly changing weather, uh, and your lift conditions change significantly. Uh, I've been flying a long time, and I've never been able to use pressure differences to, to my advantage. In other words, it does, does it give me an insight as to how the balloon's going to fly tomorrow? The, the pressure's low. The only thing I've found in, in those cases is, is the weather may go bad, you know, but I've never had any relevant feel as to a high pressure day versus low pressure other than the weather tends to be bad and low pressure. However, the temperature is huge. That's everything. And temperature obviously affects how hot you have to heat the balloon to get the thing off the ground. Essentially what the temperature does, it affects your load, your fuel consumption, and your performance. And how does that show up in real life? Well, if you've been doing passenger rides every weekend, taking three people up and you're 90 even, well, it's going to be all of a sudden it's 10 degrees. You're having a heat wave in the middle of the summer. It's 10 degrees hotter than it's been. Well, you have got to do something because you've probably been running fairly warm anyway. And with 10 degrees warmer temperature outside, you're probably going to have to cut back on your passenger loading because the balloon, you don't want to lose your performance um, parameters. In other words, be able to go to altitude if you need to to get out of a jam or, you know, to, and to get somewhere. And the other things that happen, your fuel consumption goes way up if you're 
pushing your, the limits of your balloon anyway to some degree. Uh, if your balloon only flies an hour and a half total with no reserve, all of a sudden you're going to be at close to an hour with no reserve. And if these people are expecting an hour, perhaps you might be in a compromised situation. So your fuel consumption is going to go up and your performance is going to go down. When you go to do that steep descent to get that last landing place, that balloon isn't going to want to stop. You're going to have to keep burning and burning. And if you're not aware of that, it can have some severe consequences. So the performance goes down. You have to, you have to think more. If you're used to flying a certain way, you have to consider it. Because some of the, the balloon won't do some maneuvers. Are doing very well. And B, atmospheric stability. There is a stability index that um, gliders tend to look, look after. And what they're looking for is instability. And we obviously are looking for stability. We want no outside forces affecting how we fly the balloon. And instability is going to be on days that you see cumulus clouds, little, little buildup, and certainly after the sun's been up for a while in the summer, becomes unstable in general. So, you, you know, it's hard to describe what, what to do here. Obviously, the balloons want a very stable atmosphere. That's why we fly in the morning and sometimes late evening in certain places. Uh, we don't want any kind of buildup, any kind of little puffy clouds starting to build up. It's time for us to get down because instability breeds thermals and they take us for a ride, sometimes horizontally, sometimes vertically. Cloud formations. There are some friendly clouds and there are some hostile clouds. The friendly clouds, uh, the cirrus and the stratus, um, they, if we fly alongside them, generally there's no issues there. Uh, you just have to look at the other conditions and see if the wind and uh, the upper winds are okay. And uh, generally they don't create a situation that um, you need to be alarmed about. However, cumulus clouds, any kind of buildup, even when it's a clear blue sky and you see one little puffy uh, with a little bit of darkness at the bottom, any of those, even little ones, that's an indication of instability and it, it's a flight you will remember if you take it. And out in the mountains, um, lenticular clouds, they have a not, they're really pretty clouds, but they tend to form over the tops of the mountains. In the shape of a lens, they tend to follow the contour of the top of the mountain, when, and they are usually indicative of high winds. Now, they may not be down on the valley floor, but it's another one of those red flags that you need to pay attention, and you don't want to push the envelope if you do decide to fly. Thunderstorms and associated turbulence. Thunderstorms are the worst, well... I guess a tornado and a hurricane would be a bad flight, but uh, thunderstorms are just terrible. Gusting, uh, no direction. I mean, uh, and they, there's ups and up and down drafts, but and and that's pretty obvious. Uh, there's no balloons around that that do that on a regular basis. They're either not here or have never done it. So, the the problem with thunderstorms is uh, knowing where they are. And what they do, uh, nobody in their right mind is going to launch next to one, even if you, you did have enough calm conditions to put it up, because they're just ominous, and they create lots of wind and gusting right around them. The risk, though, is that you don't know where they are, and you put up, and then they come and, and create lifting right on top of it. That happens out in the Midwest in the afternoon a lot of times. They get these cells that pop up. And you've been calling weather and everything is past you or well to the um, east of you, traveling east. And all of a sudden this thing pops up. Now those are scary and there's not much you can do about it except keep calling weather. And you keep looking up. But out there when it's warm in the summer, it's kind of hazy and you don't see the dark, nice shaped black cloud. You, you can't tell it's there. 
The other problem with uh, thunderstorms or cells is the gust front that they create. They go up and they go down, they go up and they go down, and when they dissipate, that cold air drives to the ground and has nowhere to go. There's no more lifting, and it just pushes out. It's called a gust front. And in the past, um, the rule of thumb was to make sure you're at least 20 miles from a thunderstorm. That didn't work. And then they started using 50 miles. And I think there was a balloon race in New York somewhere. Some guys got caught up in some 40-mile-an-hour winds, and they were 80 miles away. So now they're saying about 100 miles. And if you have a weather, um, a weather man who can predict these gust fronts and can see them, perhaps on Doppler, maybe you're a little better off. But that's the problem with them. If you're in a vicinity anywhere, they can push this gust front out, and you don't see it. I mean, this nice kind of blue, white, puffy clouds, and, and it's coming from somewhere else. So they're scary, and they're bad to get caught in. Thermals. Thermals are rising columns of air. They're created by the sun heating the ground, whatever, parking lot, rocks, just whatever, brown dirt, anything. And the hot air wanting to rise. And when they go up, usually the surrounding fields, the cooler air, replaces that. Well, thermals do a lot of stuff to, to, to balloons. Again, we don't want any outside forces acting for the most part. We, all want, we want to be in air that's just moving along and we can do what we want. In a thermal, a traditional thermal, you go straight up. Maybe... 500, 1,000 feet, couple hundred feet, whatever. A lot of times they'll trigger and kick you up a little, and then, then they'll slow down and kick you out. They tend to form in times of calm air, usually late in the morning. It looks great out because it's not moving fast, but all of a sudden these things trigger. You get a hot spot, parking lot, dark ground, and it starts picking up, and then everything swirls, and first thing you know, you're going up. Now, the, the trick is if you get caught in a traditional thermal, you ride it up. In theory, you keep the balloon at equilibrium with the air mass. You know, it's hard to say exactly what that is, but what you don't do is vent because you're not going to outvent that air flow going up. All you're going to do is get cold, and when that thing dissipates, you're going to come down like a rock. So you keep at equilibrium with the air mass, or actually... I tend to um, accelerate a little up on top of it because I want to get to the top. At the top, wherever that is, you, um, you stay up there. I used to come down and try to get down because obviously you're, you're wanting to get on the ground at that point. You're not feeling real good about this because when this thing takes you, you don't do anything. You just hang on. And it just, phew, you're gone. You're gone into the sky. So, so anyway... The, the, the trick that I, I feel most comfortable telling you is don't vent, obviously. Keep the volume of the balloon up. It can be a little bit, uh, can distort the balloon a little bit in there, but it tends to be usually a smooth ride. You go up, hit the top, wherever it is, it'll slowly stop, and you just stay up there, and there's usually a light wind going somewhere up there, but it's very slow usually because it's calm, and you just ride that out away from that, trigger zone if you will and then you make an approach to the biggest field you can find and you aim for the center of that field because not only do thermals take you up but when they're starting to trigger anything in the area they take you sideways in fact many of the, tr the thermals out here will take you in a semicircle about 10 knots maybe a couple blocks and stop and then you accelerate 10 knots, come back here. So you really, you, you make any kind of approach and you can get, just get kicked off suddenly. So the plan is to aim for the middle of the biggest field you can find. And then if you're making an approach and you get kicked off, you, you may still have time to drive it into the field. 
land and sea or lake breezes. This, um, this occurs uh, especially when uh, the, the sea or lake or whatever is, is rather large because you need to have a big body of water to make this happen. And it, something similar to this happens out off the coast of San Diego. In the evening, the desert behind San Diego to the east of San Diego is heating up all day. It's hot, and all that air is rising. And the water is staying at a uniform temperature, and it's relatively cool. So this air is going up, and it's sucking this air in from the, from the water on shore. So you have pretty much an onshore breeze when, when the terrain is warmer than the water. It's going up and the water, the air above the water is replacing it. Now at night, just the opposite happens. The water tends to be relatively warmer as the evening goes on and this all cools down. The radiant, there's no radiant heat here. This stays warm and this tends to rise the water and the air goes back out to sea. That's why the surfers like it in the morning because they have a, an offshore breeze keeps the, the waves up, the wall. And it just works that way every day. So it's great for ballooning down there. When you take off, you, it's in the evening, you, you, the wind's just ripping about 10 to 12 knots. You've got to tie off and then you blast up. And what it does is it tends to roll parallel to the beach at about 1,000 feet. The guys ride down there, and then you can just, I mean, it's like a highway. You can jump into that lower wind and go anywhere you want. And on some days, it doesn't work all the time, you can go on up another two or 3,000 and actually go out to sea and get into the, you know, the actual big circulation. You go out to sea about a half mile, drop down, always watching that flag on the, on the beach, make sure it's staying in, drop down, you can ride the surf in. Now, there is a point. It's called a wind line that you go too far and then you get caught in something else and that's an ugly ride. It's a one-way trip. So anyway, now we're on to orographic winds. Orographic winds are winds that are created by some mechanical means. They tend to be attributed to uh, orographic lifting. In other words, when the winds hit the mountains, there are several ways to lift, uh, which sometimes creates cumulus. Uh, the heat rising does it one way, and if in, in some situations you get uh, the wind going up the mountains and it creates the same type of environment and it creates thunderstorms, creates its own weather. But orographic winds tend to be um, mechanically driven winds. You'll have orographic winds between buildings in town. And number three, which I've gone over a little before, makes competent go, no go decisions based on available weather information. As I said before, you want to use essentially two sources of weather, one being the one you call about, and the other, the actual visual uh, at the field, and then combine them and make a decision based on that. One thing uh, is just a personal note, um, making a go, no go decision when it's uh, somewhat marginal. Certainly you don't ever want to fly in a condition that could develop into something that you just can't handle, number one. Once you've landed in windy landings, um, you know, five or six times, you can probably handle some stuff. Uh, you don't want to obviously take big risks. but if you decide that it looks pretty good but you're not sure yet when you get to the field based on all the information, your visual and your, your, your uh, forecast, I quite often, if I'm in the mood and, and everything feels okay except for a couple of little things, uh, the forecast is, 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 or I'm looking at some clouds that have been coming but now they've stopped, uh, I will quite often start inflating. Doesn't mean I'm going. Just means mentally I'm still geared with the plan. I'm going to fly. And I am looking for reasons to cancel. And I'll cancel all the way up till that last burn before I leave the ground. And I have. 
the the benefit of doing that is that as i said mentally you're still engaged with flying when sometimes you've you've decided not to fly and you relax and you know your mind's off of it and you're socializing and all of a sudden you see some other balloons go and you decide to go your frame of mind isn't quite as good as if you you know kept the same decision and and and, and continuity of thought and the other thing that happens is that if all of a sudden everything breaks out as you had hoped, you got a head start. I mean, you know, time is of the essence, flying a balloon. So if you take off and, and it's good, I've, I can't tell you how many times I've taken off and everybody else or a few of them are scrambling to get ready to go because they see it and by the time they're inflating, it's gusty and blowing around on the ground, which is fairly easy to land in, but it's hard to inflate in. So... Uh, there's something about that frame of mind. It doesn't mean you go once you pull it off the truck. It just means that you're prepared. And, and sometimes it's not worth doing that. But if you really want to fly, sometimes it's worth pushing it and seeing. And uh, I've deflated um, at the last second a number of times. No, no question about it. So, any other questions? Great. Getting this, huh? That's great. All right. Be back for the next chapter in a second. Okay, now we're going to skip flight planning in the airspace system and performance and limitations um, to for when I have the appropriate audiovisual aids. We're going to go to task F, which is operation of systems. And the objective is for the applicant to determine that the applicant exhibits knowledge of the elements related to the operation of systems on the balloon provided for the practical test by explaining the following. Fuel system and associated gauges. Well, uh, the easiest way to describe it is just to describe what happens throughout the, the process of uh, the fuel being in the cylinder all the way to the burner. And what happens is the fuel is kept in a anywhere from a 10 to 20 gallon tank in the basket. Um, aluminum, stainless steel, uh, they're made of all kinds of things. But the balloon tanks do share some unique characteristics uh, compared to other propane tanks. The valve that we draw the fuel from to run the burner is, is a dip tube that goes to the bottom of the tank. In other words, the valve opens up and it, it draws from the very bottom of the tank which is different than a lot of applications for propane. A Bunsen burner or even a stove draws from the top. They draw from the gas. We're drawing from the liquid. We need all the BTUs to keep the balloon in the air. So when we open that valve up, essentially the liquid propane would travel up the dip tube, through the hose, up to the blast valve. And when the blast valve is off, it stops there. When the blast valve's on, goes into the burner system, and sometimes it has its plumb several directions, but pretty much goes up and then it goes through the coils and comes down to an area inside the can of the burner and spreads out to, well, uh, they're all essentially the same, but a jet system where they will spray up hit the pilot light and then ignite and then burn. What happens in there, the coil, once the burner is activated and it's burning, the coil actually acts as a preheater. As, as the flame is impinging on the coil, this liquid propane is warming up, expanding, and going towards a vapor state because it's still liquid. And the engineering design is such that when it hits this jet, it is almost vapor. And by the time it hits the ambient air on the way to the pilot light, it's pretty much all vapor. 
and at a high rate of speed. It's coming out at a high rate of speed because it's been expanding the whole time. And it comes out in a combustible concentration and then it burns and it burns hard and fast. Propane will not burn unless it's between a 2 and a 9 percent concentration. So pure liquid just like gasoline won't burn. If you put pure liquid coming out of that burner it just won't light. Now some of the edges might dissipate and catch fire but in general the liquid itself won't light. So it's the object of the burner to go through the, put the liquid through the coils and heat it up enough and allow enough expansion so that when it does come out to ambient air that it's just right and primed for burning. So that's how we get all the power out of the propane. If we just had a, a tube going down to the top of the propane tank, which is just gas, there's just no way to develop enough BTUs to fly a balloon. Now, that, that given, there's another little thing that occurs sometimes when it's very cold. The first blast doesn't have the benefit of a, a flame coming out. You know, you've got pure liquid coming through and shooting out. Well, that first little bit, we call it the fireball effect. It does happen mainly in the wintertime. It comes out of there. The liquid comes out. It won't light keeps going and obviously in the ambient air it starts expanding some and unfortunately right around the mouth is when it's expanded enough to um, to to cause combustion a little bit of the pilot light catches it and it just goes Whoo! and then the engine starts and then it burns true again but uh, it, it's important to be careful in the winter time when your coils are cold. You can kind of preheat them a little bit or burn ahead of time before you set up uh, for your inflation. And that little bit of warmth will usually do the job. So that's just something on the side to, to, to uh, understand. Uh, the gauges involved, the tank gauges um, at the top of the tank read percentage left over. In other words, um, the way a, a tank gauge works is it has a, uh, a shaft that goes down and inside there's a, uh, a shaft that, that spins and, and spins the gauge. Well at the bottom it's uh, on a gear, has a float on one side and a, and a counterweight over here and when the float goes to the bottom, which means it's empty, obviously it's at zero. The problem is it can't, this rod can only be so long, it can't go to the top of the tank because the tank's only this wide. So this rod kind of has to sit up here at the 55% level or on smaller tanks, the aluminum tank's only the 33% level. And then as it goes down that last 33%, you, it reads from 33 to zero. Because obviously you want to know how much you have left at the end. The first 33% wouldn't do you much good. It'd be nice to know, but you wouldn't know from 66% down how much fuel you have. And that's why you, you start hearing it sometimes. You'll start hearing the thing kind of moving and you'll hear when that, when that needle is, uh, is starting to move and register. Okay, venting or deflation systems. The most, most of the balloons now use a parachute top. This is essentially uh, isolated away. Looks just like a parachute. There's big top, round, and uh, confluence lines that come to one point, and then the rope is tied to that, and it's come down the side of the balloon so it doesn't go right on top of the burner and into the basket. It has an opposing hole that... The parachute top is bigger than, obviously, to seal. It works just like a valve. It goes up and down. The air pressure inside the balloon keeps it against the top and sealed. Now, there's a few tricks to make sure it seals good uh, from the repair part of view, and they're actually a little tricky to make them seal. Uh, the other part of the parachute top is that there are centering lines that, that keep it that are tied from the edge of the parachute over to the existing skin on the envelope 
in all directions so that it doesn't come down and slide over and make a big hole. So uh, once the balloon is vertical, it's just air pressure keeping it up. And certainly if you pull too much, the air that would be going around it and out the top would create down pressure this way and it could deflate. But it would take an awful lot of pulling to do that. But that's how you do a high wind deflation in a parachute. You keep pulling and pulling and pulling until you can't pull more. And eventually the pressure down here tends to cavitate because most of the air is going around it and pushing down and out through the top. So that's how you do a high wind deflation. The good thing about a parachute top is that you can do a, you can dump a lot of air quickly. It's very positive, very safe, but you can pull it hard and dump, um, I don't know what kind of percentage, but certainly enough to affect a landing. In other words, to get you to stick, stick to the ground and hit the ground and stay. It, it's very effective for that, very effective for maneuvering. In the balloon, there's there's a um, requirement in the in all the flight manuals for three different instruments, at least in the U.S. One is the altimeter, which tells you how high you are above sea level, and some are adjusted for ground level. And the variometer, which tells you how fast, what rate of speed you're going up or down. You can set them to different scales, but generally it's a feet, 100 feet per minute, up or down. And, uh, and a pyrometer. Pyrometers are notoriously wrong and, and, and malfunctioning at times, but uh, they are a required instrument. In the past, they've usually had a thermistor at the top of the envelope and had a wire that would run down the side of the envelope to a set of instruments. These were the most effective uh, and accurate. However, there's some danger there if you ever hit the ground and lean up against a power line. There have been some accidents from people grabbing and getting electrocuted. So that's the downside of a wire. So they've gone to wireless pyrometers, which um, eliminate that problem, but <laughs> aren't quite as uh, reliable, I guess. But in any case, those are the three instruments that are required, and they are required to be on board and work. Uh, aviation communication systems is appropriate, appropriate avionics. If you are going to fly in airspace that requires a radio and or a transponder, obviously you have to have a two-way radio or transponder. If you're going to fly in Class B airspace, you will be required to have a two-way radio to talk to the tower and a transponder with mode C which means it gives you your altitude, gives them your altitude. And if you're in class C, you have to have a radio and a transponder as well. If you're in class D, you have to have a two-way radio. And if you're in a, a non-towered airport, it's highly recommended that you have a two-way radio for, to use Unicom to broadcast your intentions and where you are and what you're doing to any other airplanes that may be making approaches or taking off from the field. Okay. Air medical factors. Um, task G, air medical factors. The objective to determine that the applicant exhibits knowledge of the elements related to aromatical factors by explaining one, the symptoms, causes, effects, and corrective actions of at least three of the following. Well, hypoxia, that's lack of oxygen. Uh, the old balloonists back at the turn of the century used to, one way to recognize that they had hypoxia is their fingernails would turn blue. Um, you tend to, what in reality, what tends to happen is you get headache, um, dizzy sometimes. It's a little different. You become a little disoriented. Uh, sometimes you feel okay, but your decisions aren't quite right. And sometimes it's, there's euphoria. You think everything's looking good. It's really a bad time for that to happen. 
And the way to fix it is either have onboard oxygen or descend. Hyperventilation is usually when somebody gets too excited. It's usually a passenger. If the uh, pilot's hyperventilating, there, there's a lot of issues going on up there. But if someone's hyperventilating, you need to either have them breathe in a bag or talk, put your hands on them and talk to them and reassure them and, and get them to bring their breathing rate down. It's, um, I think it, um, I don't really know what caused it, excessive uh, CO2 or, because when you breathe in, no, you want, you need more CO2. I think it's too more, too much oxygen. I don't, I don't even remember what that is, but middle ear and sinus problems. Uh, there's not much you can do with the middle ear, but if uh, you weren't uh, if you weren't experiencing any um, disorientation before you took off, and all of a sudden you're getting dizzy, uh, or you you can't clear your nose, your sinus is about to kill you. You just go back down, go back to another altitude. Spatial disorientation doesn't tend to happen in balloons because the balloon is generally vertical relative to the earth or the gravitational pull. In airplanes, it can happen in, in IFR conditions because you can't see anything. Many times the airplane can be inverted or sideways or whatever and you can't see it. And you're taught to look at your instruments and rely on them at that point. Fortunately, a balloon, uh, gravity and the earth tend to be straight down with rare exception. So. Uh, I'm, you can get spatial disorientation, but um, you need to focus on something near you, hold on, and descend to where you can see. Stress and fatigue, it's obvious uh, if other, there's other stress factors besides the balloon flight. You need to resolve those because they will affect your ability to make decisions. And fatigue uh, will certainly um, impact your decision making and you need to be rested when you fly. You fly so much better. Okay, uh, any more questions? Great. You're getting this down, huh? Good. Good to hear. Great. Okay, let's go on. Um, number two, the effects of alcohol and drugs. Alcohol, along with drugs, will slow your reaction time and your diminish and diminish your ability to make wise decisions. In a balloon especially, and in all aircraft, sometimes a decision time comes and goes without any obvious um, trigger. And it's important to make that decision. And that's the reason that alcohol and drugs can create a severe problem. If you don't, if you're going the wrong way and you don't consider it, uh, everything's fat and happy until you get into a problem where you can't get out of the mountains, for instance, or you're in a river area or swamp or whatever, you can have dire consequences as a result. So it's important that you, that you have your clear thinking, you're not tired, not stressed thinking of something else because it will affect your decision making and your reaction time. Over-the-counter drugs are an interesting uh, problem sometimes. When you have a cold, obviously um, you're wanting some kind of relief, and, and perhaps you're not having, um, you're not being able to clear your nose and your sinuses. Uh, the tendency is to go for some um, over-the-counter stuff, Sudafed or whatever. Sometimes that will affect your decision making. Sometimes it'll make you drowsy. It depends on what kind of drug you. Um, you prefer and, and choose. Uh, but certainly, if you choose to take any of those drugs, if they affect you in any way that slows you down, tires you out, or affects your judgment, or the way you operate equipment in any form, you should not fly. And it's best to understand this before you take the drug. The effects of nitrogen excesses during scuba dives upon a pilot and passenger in flight. Scuba diving uh, tends to compress 
everything in your body. It compresses your, um, your bloodstream and your blood, and what it does is it, t it compresses the nitrogen in your blood into your tissues. And that's not a real problem as long as you give it time to come back out into the bloodstream. In severe cases, uh, diving accidents occur because the nitrogen is pushed so far in into your tissues and the diver comes up quickly and these nitrogen bubbles expand in the tissues. Instead of going back the way they came into the bloodstream, they tend to find the most open area they can to, to expand because it's the easiest way out. And they tend to go to the joints or your nervous system, or, and that's what calls, causes the bends. And it can be severe, it can kill you, it can paralyze you, it can just hurt, whatever. But that has to be recompressed so that the nitrogen goes back into your, your tissues and then and then it has and then it has to be and you have to come back to the surface or recompress uncompress slowly so that it, go, it reverts back to the blood and anyway the reason that you don't want to fly in a balloon or even an airplane within 24 hours after you dove is that this process is still going on once you've come to the surface these nitrogen bubbles are trying to go somewhere and they will tend to go back into your bloodstream if you give it a chance. But if you expand them by going up in altitude, they, there's a chance that they'll reverse and, and uh, revert back to your joints or your, your nervous system or, and cause some kind of physical damage. And the rest of this here is the flight flight test okay in the case that we are not uh, we don't have to make a high wind landing um, I want to describe the proper procedures for making a high wind landing and uh, to do it safely um, High wind, uh, I've heard different definitions. If it's faster than your crew can run or something of that nature or uh, faster than the car can go, uh, it's considered a high wind. I think a high wind landing uh, would be best defined as uh, wind sufficient that the balloon can't stop on its own without deflating. But let, su suffice it to say, let's look at about 10 miles an hour and plus. I mean, it. A balloon has a lot of inertia at 10 miles an hour and can do a lot of damage to property and people if they grab it or if someone comes out, uh, the balloon can go over them. So, so you're in the danger zone and want to stop this big inertia mass. Uh, from 10 miles an hour on, you, you, need to, you need to execute it properly. Now, high wind landing, um, the, the, the pitfalls that I've seen um, are that people um, don't fly the balloon well. They don't have control of the balloon when they're coming in. They, they overburn or whatever. They're up here and then they just pull the top out. Well, the acceleration down is rather significant and when you hit the ground with quite a bit of vertical and then you combine it with the wind speed, there's a big jolt at the bottom. The majority of insurance claims are from high wind landings. People twisting ankles, hurting themselves, hurting their, sticking their arms out, and so on and so forth. So, the way to eliminate this, uh, there's been a kind of a rule of thumb in the U.S. for years that you face forward, hang on in two places, bend your knees, and get ready. Well, um, lately I've been thinking a little bit differently on that. The British have been doing it differently for years, and in Africa they've been doing it differently for years as well. And it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and what they say is that you turn backwards, you have your passengers face backwards, and hold on to whatever is appropriate on the upwind side of the basket, the uprights, the tank edge, uh, the ropes that are up there. 
Hope keep your feet together and bend your knees. You have a lot of strength, especially when your legs are together. Your your ankles are very strong and they don't tend to roll. You are not coming in face first as you would in the other method, trying to hold on behind you and having only a place to put your hands in front of you as the ground's going by when you're dragging, which is uh, suicide. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be said about going in backwards. And the elderly people can even hold on. There's a lot of strength up here and a lot of spring. They can bend down and go over backwards and, um, and they'll also um, survive an impact better, a vertical impact, because you spring better in that direction. So anyway, that's what we're going to look at here. Um, and there's another factor that's involved with highway lands, the approach. Um, airplanes approach, they're going about 100 miles an hour when they're trying to land. They slow down, but they come in about this angle, and it's rather uneventful in most cases. Well, the balloon needs to follow that approach in a high wind landing, very similar approach. You need a shallow approach. Now, sometimes you're not able to do a shallow approach. You're having to go over a tree and dive down into a field before you hit the far end. And in those situations, you can't do much about it. But in general, you want a shallow approach. There's some steering involved many times. You have to go up and down 100 feet to, to, to position yourself into the field where you want to be so that you're not catching an edge of it. And what you're doing out here is you're looking way in the distance. In other words, if, you, if this is, this is uh, half a mile or whatever, you're out here looking at this field, whereas in uh, a slow wind, you might be looking here or there. But you're looking out here, and the perspective is very similar. It's not coming at you very quickly, so you have plenty of time to work it, and you work your way down work your way down and you look at the highest obstacle that's in your way before the final landing and that's what you have to clear and you don't get below it maybe you get a little below it as you approach here but you get it back up so you're prepared to come over it and clear it as closely as possible and come down to make your touchdown for the high wind landing so it's a shallow approach that's the number one key factor Number two, um, the passenger briefing. You have to rebrief your passengers because a high wind land landing is potentially dangerous. Have them face backwards, even though they may not want to. You have them face backwards and have them practice crouching in the basket and holding on and reassuring them there will be no problem. Just uh, bend down and crouch down if they're nervous and uh, they won't go anywhere. The worst that could happen is they fall to the bottom of the basket. And as the pilot, um, I, I try to face backwards a little early once, just, just practicing this method, and uh, that was a little scary. So what I do is uh, get right to when I'm starting to pull that top, and then, then I can just roll with my back to the wicker, and it seemed to work fine. In fact, it gave me a lot of friction. I was able to hold on and keep pulling because that's another issue when you fall over. If people fall on you, on you and you're facing forward, it's hard to keep those arms pulling because you want to pull all you can get. High wind landing is not dissimilar to um, an impending accident in a vehicle. If you see a truck running through a stop sign, um, you don't apply the brakes. You don't tap the brakes. You slam on the brakes. So, and, and, it, and it transfers to this. Um, there, there are many times uh, I, I, I have trouble getting this across. You pull the vent until you can't pull anymore. And from the industry, we just say you pull until you have the pulley in your hand. And then there's just no more to pull. You don't pull, is this enough? It's never enough. You pull until you can't pull anymore. Then you're going to get the maximum efficiency of that top deflating and the balloon is going to flatten out and then stop. As long as that balloon has air in it and there's wind coming, it's just an airfoil. It's just going to keep dragging and you're going to increase your risk for, for injury. So, shallow approach, 
aim for the highest obstacle so that you can clear it. You don't want to be below it towards the end or you'll have to overburn and you'll miss your whole place. Always stay above that line and at the end you can let yourself fall towards the line so that you have a good angle to the field. Brief your passengers and if you have to shake the basket and make them hang on, do not let them grab cameras and hold on to a purse or a camera or anything else. They have to hold on with two hands or they're going to break away and hit someone else. And when you come down to land, you start pulling and you don't stop till the balloon stop. You keep trying to keep pulling. And pretty much, uh, that's it. Sounds easy. There, there is a discussion about pilot lights and highwind landings. And I've done, uh, and what the discussion is this. There's uh, a school of thought that says turn the pilot lights off before you hit the ground in a high wind landing. Uh, there are some benefits to this, especially in a balloon where the, the burners are free rolling. You could hit hard and the burners could spin. Cable could get slack and start and pull a blast valve and open it up and it could be facing down. Um, I personally have um, have had issues with this because I, I have uh, paid great attention to the control in coming in at a high wind landing, and I finesse that balloon as much as I can, even to the last inch before I pull that top out, so that there's no vertical impact when you hit. So I keep my pilot's lights on, <clears throat> because if you're going to turn them off, you're going to almost have to turn them off right here over this last obstacle and you're going to go in from there you have no more control if you see a fence or if you see a, some wood or something an obstacle in the way you're committed uh, obviously uh, there's an impact and a jolt and a potentially you know you could dislodge a tank or you know fuel you could cause a leak it's, uh, it's the risk is slim there but the burner's still alive and running so you know, there's there's all kinds of possibilities. So, the, the, it is a question, and whatever you feel comfortable with, I say you stay with it. Um, I think facing backwards offers a little bit more protection and impact, in vertical impact, and may allow more vertical landings, landings with more vertical speed to them, safer. In which case, you could turn your pilot lights off early and not have to finesse it in because I, that's the way I've always done it. And I did a, a survey with the active uh, balloon pilots around the country, and uh, it was just a little personal thing I was doing. And about 40% of them don't turn them off. They don't, they say not only no, but hell no, because too many things happen at the end. And 40 to 50%, yes, oh yes, definitely. Um, so, so it's a tough call, but when, when certainly in cases where there's high grass, dead grass, or whatever, uh, yeah, I, I tap the ground and I start turning them off then. Yeah, there's no question. There, there are other mitigating circumstances, but in general, I keep control of that balloon till it's almost stopped, if not stopped. Okay. Any questions? Great. Great. Okay. Um, winter flying. Um, this is uh, area of operations five, performance maneuvers. Uh, we're talking about winter flying. And it asks the... Um, Applicant to determine the uh, if that they exhibit the knowledge of the elements related to winter flying by explaining the proper preparation, equipment, and survival supplies necessary for flight in cold temperatures. The part of a body that's at most risk is the extremities. In fact, on a normal balloon flight in cold climates and cold temperatures, the feet get the coldest. There seems to be a layer of 
just dead cold air at the bottom of the basket. The next likely candidate is the hands, but the feet tend to get the most discomfort at first. And in terms of normal flights and winter conditions, um, it's important to, uh, to have, at least on the chase vehicle, a blanket or something in case someone does have an injury so that they don't uh, uh, get hypothermia or go into some kind of shock. Uh, but in general, uh, if, if you're going on a normal winter flight and the weather's decent, uh, you just want to make sure that the passengers and everyone has the warmest boots they can find, good gloves, big jackets, and be prepared for the, particularly in the Midwest, the breezes that can ensue after you land. It's cold and windy. And you want to have water as well if it doesn't freeze. Um, and also the normal things, cell phone um, and method of communication. Proper methods for pressurizing fuel tanks. Well, when, when the temperature goes down, propane pressure goes down. And depending on how old the burner system is, um, sometimes 40 degrees and below tend to make the balloon fly fairly mushy, pretty anemic. So the only way to, to deal with this is to add pressure to the propane and get more going through the the burner which which was designed for a certain pressure once it goes down below a certain amount it it just doesn't put out the heat that, that makes it safe in general some balloon systems say 60 to 80 is flyable but you're in the marginal level below 60 is a no fly psi that's pounds per square inch of propane and above 80 is okay but I'm here to tell you, anything, you know, from 90 on down is pretty mushy. The balloon just doesn't want to go. And sometimes you might get yourself in a situation, especially if it's windy, that it's just you can't do a certain maneuver without slapping the ground hard or hitting, hitting something. So anyway, the uh, methods for offsetting this are nitrogen presser, pressurization, nitrogen pressurization and the use of heat tapes and the heat tapes um, have some advantage it's nice it's warm propane it's uh, it's it's the real stuff and it's and it's accomplished by wrapping a heat tape around a tank taping it down and then putting a jacket over it for insulation and then the downside is you have to plug it in at a certain time you don't want to plug it in too early or it'll overheat and could pop off. Um, sometimes people set a timer, uh, maybe at midnight, and they find out what it takes to get 150 PSI the next day, which is a nice warm temperature. And they turn it and have it turn on at midnight, and, and when they get there in the morning, it's great. There's electrical hazards. You know, there can be arcing, and you know, once these things are kind of old. Um, power goes off, then you don't fly the next day. Lots of little problems. And nitrogen, on the other hand, um, you just artificially pressurize the cold propane and it pushes out. And if you follow the, the, uh, the gas laws, you would think that once you have put nitrogen in the, um, the vapor area, and filled it up and pressurized it, you would think once that volume doubles, the vapor area doubles, you lose half your pressure. But nitrogen actually works pretty well. It goes into solution as well, and it comes out and keeps the pressure up reasonably well. And perhaps uh, the, the best thing about it is when your tank is low, you still have pressure. Whereas if you are flying um, with warm tanks and you've been up an hour or two, your tanks are cold by then, and and you don't have much volume in there either, and um, it's not very usable at the end. Aerostar is the only one who, the only balloon manufacturer who has gone to the effort to, to have nitrogen approved as a fuel additive. Now, in the industry, people use it, 
you know, because it works. In general, it doesn't affect the quality of fuel. But uh, legally, um, unless you have a 337 to use it, you're not supposed to. Also, In addition, you should not use nitrogen on a vapor-fed pilot light. That is one that comes from the top of the tank, a separate hose, comes up and feeds vapor into the burner and feeds the pilot light. Because what happens in the tank is this nitrogen does collect at the top and it dilutes the combustibility of the propane and Unfortunately, the pilot light usually works at first until you get up in the air, and then all of a sudden it just goes away and quits. It can only be used safely on liquid pilot lights that mix it up, and there seems to be plenty of uh, combustible propane. And in the winter, um, as I said, the fireball is a concern on the first burn. You got liquid coming through the coils with no advantage of heating and the first liquid that shoots out of there does not come into the concentration the two to nine percent concentration of propane it's it's too rich until it gets about at the mouth somewhere in there then it expands in the atmosphere and then it will light and of course then you get a big whoosh and it'll burn your whole your whole mouth up so you want to preheat the coils a little bit or burn a little before you inflate the balloon, Just stick the burner straight up or, or even if you're careful, pull the cables off the side and burn a little without the envelope in the way. And uh, also in the winter, O-rings get hard if there's any O-rings in your system and leaks, uh, the, the, the seals tend to, tend to get cold. So if, they, if you have a little leak at first, the only way you're going to stop it is to shut everything down and undo the connection or whatever's leaking and, and try to warm it up with your hand or blowing on it or whatever. And generally, when you reseal it and it seals, it, it will stay for the rest of the flight. So once you fix it, it's usually okay. But you have to get it fixed. Task H, mountain flying. To determine that the applicant exhibits knowledge of the elements related to mountain flying by explaining the proper preparation, equipment, and survival supplies necessary for flight over the mountainous terrain. Well, as we spoke about in the last section, um, personal protective equipment, boots, uh, gloves, jackets, whatever, is, is obvious. When you go over mountains, the best time to go over a mountain is uh, in the winter because uh, the balloon flies so much more efficiently. There's more winds up above and it tends to uh, invert in the valley so it's calm. So you, you get a good quick trip over the top and then you can come down. The real issue in the winter is uh, communication, backup communication. Make sure you have a cell phone, radios at work. And if you do not connect with the crew in a certain amount of time, make sure they have your flight plan and, and your general direction. And before you lose them at the takeoff spot, in other words, you're going over the mountain and you look back to the crew who's still there, tell them what your plans are, what you see, because you can already see what's going to happen about where you're going to go and tell them your line of flight. The other thing is, it's uh, in an airplane, many times it's important to stay with the airplane if you have a crash because no one, no one has a, even a general idea where you are. In the balloon, it's important to bring uh, some way to walk around in the snow. Snowshoes, skis, or I mean, if you're good, yeah, but snowshoes because it'd be a shame to be, get becalmed or uh, run out of gas or... Um, um, something of that nature, something simple, and stick you in the mountains when uh, it's a nice day anyway. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be flying. And, and you might be five, 
you know, three, four, five, six miles from a road, in which case you could get to a road and communicate with the crew and, and get things done. You, you really don't want to sit in the middle of the mountains all night when you're five miles away in, re in relatively decent terrain. Now, there are exceptions to that, but um, in general, you want to bring along snowshoes or a way to, to maneuver around. And of course, you want to bring water and food and prepare for perhaps an overnight, depending on where you're flying and how hostile and how big, you know, how far away you are from civilization. Okay. The accessibility to landing areas, very important to figure that out before you take off. You look on a map, you figure I've got to make it over this section and I, and I have the biggest possibility of landing if I aim for this particular point. If I go a little left, I'll make it. If I go a little right, I'll make, make it. You don't want to aim for a little pinhole on the other side of the mountains because the odds on you getting good information as far as the upper winds and actually getting those winds uh, are slim. So you want to give yourself aim for the biggest area you can and shoot for the middle based on the information you have. Recognition of cloud formations and descending air currents on leeward side of the mountains as evidence of possible, possible turbulence. Well, with lenticulars, you probably don't want to be going anyway. Let's, let's uh, assume we're all staying on the ground with lenticular clouds or cumulus clouds. So in general, uh, some stratus clouds or benign type clouds are not a real big issue. So if you get up there and you see lenticular clouds, you're going to have to clear the mountain peaks a little higher than you might otherwise because it's a, it's a sign of wind going across the tops. And on the lee side, it curls and curls radically. The faster the wind goes, the, the rougher it is, the more severe the turbulence is. So essentially, on a mountain crossing, though, you should have a plan. You shouldn't go when it's too windy because it's very turbulent. You just go straight up, catch the upper level winds, and ensure that you have at least 1,000 feet above a peak. Uh, if they're big, big mountains, maybe you want to go two or three or even 4,000 feet above. And it's almost assuredly smooth at three and 4,000 feet above. There is a rule of thumb for how close you can get with a certain amount of airspeed, but um, and and depends on the shape of the mountain too. When it's a wall like this, it tends to be uniform and actually a little better. When it's a peak, there can be rolls to the side and down rolls, so it's real difficult to anticipate what you're gonna what you're gonna run into. But if you want to get over the top, you just you just climb and you know three or four thousand feet in general, you're gonna be okay. The 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 hazard with with mountain flying and one of the pitfalls is that when you're over the peak or just past the peak, for instance, and you're you're well cleared and everything looks good, you actually can see your um, target very well. You're, you're used to being at the altitude. You tend to get acclimated with that visually. You look down and you see your uh, target up ahead, and, and it's a natural tendency to go, well, I can just start descending the speed it looks good I'm just gonna go right there when in reality you're you're just right over here and if you come down this lee side certainly the turbulence is bad here but the whole airflow pattern still sucks back this way it draws so you don't even want it because what will happen here is you'll you'll be going here and you'll come down you'll be going here and then right here you'll hit dead air and on the way down you'll you'll slide right back into the base of that mountain and then the only way to get where you're going, because there's no place to land here, is to go up here and hit the ugly spot. This is a bad ride. I mean, the balloon just gets beat down and twisted. And when you finally get up there, and there, there's usually a fuel issue at that point, too. So you stay up, 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 up. And when it's time, you start working your way down slowly till you get... To the wind line. In other words, the upper airflow tends to kind of wave, and then there'll be tend to be light and variable air down below. And you get above that, just above it, until you get vertically or just about vertically over where you want to be. Then as soon as you drop, 
the balloon quits its horizontal movement and then you terminal down. So it's a terminal. You want to do a high speed descent and then you can be very accurate where you land. So if you look at the profile of a mountain flight, it's generally straight up because it's variable here and then you catch the uppers and you stay up here and then you, you come down square. I mean, it, it's rounded actually, but in general, that's how you want to do a safe mountain flight. The caution required in regard to wind shear encounters and possible rapid weather changes. Well, if you stay in the safe spot on the flight over, stay up here and get wide and then come down, you, this, the, the hazard of wind shears goes way down. Now, if you've picked a day that it's windy anyway and the winds at the mountaintops are 40 and 50 knots, it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to get beat up. But if you stay in the outer profile and you terminal down here and let the balloon go, you may hit some shears here, but the balloon's going to slice through them. It may narrow up. It may shear and bend. The mouth may close a little. Just make sure you don't burn. You'll feel it because there'll be wind in the face in the basket. Then it'll open back up within a few seconds. And if you want, you can pop a little heat in there or just let it go. It's very safe to go terminal all the way all the way and at about 1500 feet you can start putting some heat in it'll start tightening the balloon it'll stabilize it you'll still be going down fast and then towards the end you accelerate your burning and uh, and then the balloon will just be in normal flight down at the bottom any questions great You're getting this one huh yeah de oh Ah. ah. Never mind. All right. Three, two, one. Okay, navigation. Uh, that's going to be on the flight check itself. We'll, we'll go over navigating and ground tracking. Okay, we're in area of operations, emergency operations, seven, task A. Systems and equipment malfunctions. To determine that the applicant exhibits knowledge of the elements related to systems and equipment malfunctions appropriate to the balloon used for the practical test. Two, analyzes the situation and takes the appropriate action for simulated emergencies, such as A, pilot light flame out or failure. If the pilot light flames out, what you hear is a shh. Many times it's a real surprise when that happens. You just hear a whoosh of the, of the liquid going out. In general, the rule of thumb is you try quickly to use your piazza to relight it or a striker, and but you only spend a minimal amount of time on it. Because if it's clogged and you sit there descending trying to light your pilot light, you got problems. That's why we go over the blast valve relight. You should have been trained to squeeze the blast valve trigger and light that propane. Problem there is that liquid will not light. It has to be in a gaseous form. So that's why we squeeze, liquid comes out, and as you're letting up and it's dissipating, you're striking away, and then it usually will start and then you can blast. And at that point, while you're blasting, you're ob obviously recovering the balloon's descent, if there is a descent, and you're turning on either a, a whisper valve or a metering valve or, some, or fire to some sort of backup while you have flame. Then when you let go, you still have some kind of flame. So pilot light, flame out. Try to relight it quickly. Maybe it was an oxygen starvation issue and it relights right away, no problem. Do not waste more than a couple of seconds on it. Go straight to a burner relight, blast the liquid, let up, and on the residual, try to light the gas that's, that's in the air, and it'll usually poof, light up, blast, recover the balloon, and while you're doing that, while you're blasting, you turn on your backup system, which will act as your pilot light as well. 
Blast valve failure. What do you do if the blast valve sticks on? Well, pretty simple. You might pop it a few times or try to see if there's a way to disengage it. But if it's stuck on, you go straight to the tank and fly off the tank. Turn it off. Stops. The pilot light will still keep running because it doesn't take much to run a pilot light. Turn it back on. Turn it off. It's not difficult to fly that way. It's actually pretty simple to figure it out. Blast valve stuck closed. Try to pop it, beat on it, no, no action. Turn on your backup source and relight that, whether it be a whisper valve, metering valve, or a fire two. Same applies. If it's a liquid system, start it up and then back it off a little and light and then get it going again. Fuel exhaustion. Well, this is a tough one. The book says, do not, this is a little bit difficult or a little bit complex. The book says, always land while you have fuel or in control rather than risk a landing out of control. Makes sense. But in reality, uh, when a balloon gets low on gas, the tendency is to get low and try to make that next field. Maybe the wind has died in an evening flight and you're over stand of trees and all of a sudden there's a field up ahead, maybe quarter mile, uh, 200 yards, depending on the wind speed. But you're down to zero and 5% or whatever and you don't know when you're going to run out, but you know you still have some. Well, this becomes an interesting issue because what is usually between a field and a, and a, uh, a stand of trees and a field? What is often? set of power lines or a road and a set of power lines well it's okay to fly low because if you run out of gas it's not like an airplane or anything you just sort of you just sort of drift down it's no big deal but what if you happen to be right at that set of wires and you start falling you're done the power lines are very dangerous for balloons so that's a risk you have to consider, and um, you know it's it's uh, the concept of um, taking it in under control versus uh, waiting. Um, if, if the trees are relatively uniform, uh, I certainly don't have a problem staying right at treetop level and continuing on, uh, because if I run out of gas, it shouldn't be much different than if I intentionally take it down. It'll be very similar, unless there's a meadow or an opening or whatever. Now, if you pass something up that would save the balloon and, and get you down safely versus taking a risk over a set of wires, that's a big risk. It's a big tendency, too, though, because if you make it over the wires in the field, you're packed up in a half hour drinking champagne, whereas when you intentionally take it into this other spot in the, in the trees, you may have a whole day ahead of you getting the balloon out. So it's a draw. It, it really, you need to consider when you're low on gas, for, for, certainly you go down low, but you need to consider what might happen. Propane leak. As we've gone over in our um, emergency procedures out in the field, if you have a leak anywhere along the hose, whether it be by the burner, in the hose itself, or at the connection, you shut the valve off, burn the burner out, and go to a backup system if it's a single burner, or go to the other burner if it's a double burner. So if there's anything from the connection on up to the burner, through the hose, shut, shut the fuel source off and go to a backup. A single burner will have a secondary liquid backup system to another control. And obviously a double burner has a second burner. If there's a leak in the, um, in the valve, if you happen to have a valve, a screw type valve, while you're screwing it or turning it in or out, um, you, can, you can open it fully and it will seal at the top and generally prevent the propane from coming out. Now, you don't want to keep doing this all the time because that can degrade as well. So you want to get that fixed, but it will eliminate the, the leak if it's in the stem under the valve or under the, the, 
the valve head. Generally, any kind of leak, you shut the system down and go to your backup. Envelope failure. Envelopes are made with, with such a margin of uh, safety that uh, this is a very rare situation. Um, if any part of the balloon would fail the envelope, what the best you could hope to do would be to just add heat to offset the leak and try to land as soon as you can. And obviously, uh, in some situations, you're going to land when it tells you to land, like right now. But you're just going to keep heat in the balloon. Any other s systems and equipment malfunction appropriate to the balloon provided for the flight test? Okay, well, we'll just go over, over all the general emergency procedures. Basically, leaks, shut the system down, blow it out, go to a backup system. Um, Envelope failure, obviously uh, you don't fly if you have that choice. If you have a failure in the air, which is extremely rare, you just keep heat in there until you come down. Um, and follows a, a, the appropriate emergency checklist. This is uh, in the practical test standards, but I advise all my students to know what to do in an emergency because... There's very little time to look at a checklist. This isn't a, a big C-130 where you can go through a list of things that you want to, to resolve a situation. Generally, a balloon, it's, it's a very simple system, and you want to memorize or at least have a concept of, of, of what can happen and the resolutions, and then do them without resulting to resolving it with a checklist. So... Um, if, if, if it's appropriate, I would say, um, you know, use one. But other than that, I, I would prefer reaction to a problem. Task B, emergency equipment and survival gear. Location and purpose. Normal flying conditions, as long as it's not an adventure flight or something out of the ordinary, uh, I would say that... Uh, First aid kit in the crew, chase vehicle, plenty of water for people. <coughs> um, cell phones with access to emergency. Um, 911 is, is adequate. Um, if you're going to go in the desert, obviously more water, things of that nature. If you're in cold climates, uh, protection and that in that area is appropriate but in general most balloonists are flying locally and, uh, and and as long as they have communication and first aid and, and a decent uh, chase vehicle they're safe enough and that's that's about it on emergency equipment and survival gear uh, if, if it's appropriate to uh, an adventure flight, then uh, certainly bring uh, you know, all the survival gear that you can. But uh, on the local flights, uh, the communication and uh, water, and that's about it. I don't like to think of. See. Water landings. In general, if you're gonna, if you are forced to land in a large body of water, like Lake Michigan or some of that nature, you want to brief the passengers to stay with the basket and do not try to swim away or do something else because the basket will float. Generally, you're going to be out of gas anyway because you've tried to go somewhere and you didn't make it. So, in any case, the basket will float and they're safer staying with it. Um, you'll likely be rescued. Your crew will know that you've gone out there and they will have called the appropriate authorities and come out to help you. 
The only other thing, um, as far as water landings go, uh, balloonists can't resist uh, doing a splash and dash. You know, coming down, if they see a pond, come down there and tap the water and kind of cruise along it like a boat. Um, it's, it seems to be irresistible. Um, the, the hazards involved there um, are that when the wind speed or your crossing speed as you tap the water is more than about five or six miles an hour, it becomes increasingly more, um, I don't want to say risky, but it, it does, it, it creates more trauma, I'll put it that way. In other words, when you come down at eight miles an hour and you, you hit the water a little harder than you figured, the wicker actually gets full of water and it sucks you down and the envelope continues forward and there's no, there's no hard ground or anything to drag and kind of catch up. You're, it's dragging and the envelope keeps falling over and it's, it's, it's very scary. And it's sometimes hard to get heat back in the envelope. So the rule of thumb is if there's anything more than, I would say, six miles an hour, but even up to eight, um, don't do it. There is a way to do it safely, but um, in general, if you're going to come in at seven or eight or even ten miles an hour, what I do is I come in and I put the heat in here, to to recover the descent and actually go up and if i tap the water great i've already got inertia kicking me back up but if i don't which i miss you know i, I skim by it and then i get going up again but if you come at it your perception is usually off because you can't focus on the water very well anyway and you end up and then the envelope comes over and you drag and that's even worse in, in like the Mississippi River that's going seven or eight knots or whatever. And that six to eight miles an hour holds true for a four mile an hour stream and four miles an hour going this way. It does the same thing. It'll disrupt you and scare the life out of you. In general, when you're doing stuff around a water or pond or whatever, you're better off looking at the shore even though it's a quarter mile away in terms of altitude control than you are looking down here if there's nothing to look at but water you will lose your focus you can't see where you are and, and you'll you'll rarely be able to correlate the burn so you want to look at the horizon even though it's a long way away you can actually do better that way than you can looking down unless you've got weeds at the at the top some, some visibility or some ripples it helps but on a flat lake Bad news. D, task, thermal flight. The conditions that cause thermal activity. Warm mornings, well, warm days, a lot of sun and no wind. They tend to propagate when there's very little wind because the breeze tends to knock them down. They don't have a, a chance to trigger and generate. Recognition of convective conditions and associated hazards. Well, I mean, you see those little puffy clouds with darkness underneath and late in the morning on a hot day, just it, even if you don't see anything. Certainly the building of cumulus would be an indication. Effects of thermal activity on the moon flight. Well, generally there's two, two effects. Sometimes it's horizontal, and if you're down below an obstacle and it seems calm, you can get pulled into wires or something that's horizontal to you. So you always want to keep, particularly late in the morning, your buffer zone. You start watching things that are further away, and you maybe stay above all of them unless you're ready to commit into something. And the traditional uh, vertical, you keep heat in the balloon, keep it at equilibrium with the air mass going up or even accelerating so that you can get there faster and then get out. You get to the top, and you'll know the top. It just stops, and you stay in that wind and get away because down straight below is a trigger area, and it'll start again. You'll go back up in another one. It's best to just take your time, get out, past, and aim for the middle of the biggest field you can find. It says the procedures to be used upon encountering thermal flight, thermal activity, Hang on, <laughs> burn.
Well, that's all for the uh, oral part. Uh, did you guys enjoy that? Hmm. Well, that's all for the oral part right now. Um, there, there are a couple of other sections in here that, uh, that are going to require some visual aids. The, um, the airspace, the flight planning, and the performance and limitations. But uh, I think we've covered a lot today, and um, I hope you guys have enjoyed it. So here's Mike signing off.